Good to be back. Very good to be back. I, mean, I want to thank everybody, first of all, for the, the prayers that you sent my way, our way, and for the cards. Many of you sent cards and the visits in the hospital. Preacher's not used to getting visits in the hospital. It's supposed to be the other way around, but I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Just a little stroke, that's all it was. Everything's fine. Just a little weak in the knees still, and that's it. Just got to make some changes. Got to stop eating quite so many cookies, is what, he's, what the neurologist said. I do want to tell you what happened that night, though. Not to me. That's a big deal. But I want to tell you what, ha what the reason I was, I was called out. I'm a volunteer chaplain with the Cab County Police Department now, and I just kind of finished all of that and, and have been made officials and they called us out, the chaplains, on Thursday morning because there had been an officer that was shot. You've probably seen it on the news, young guy, early 20s, been on the force for just a little over a year maybe. The officers got called to a domestic disturbance and they said there were shots fired. Three of them arrived on the scene first. Before they could barely even get out of their cars, Somebody ambushed them. Guy was standing in between two buildings and he popped out and he started firing a handgun at them. Officer Garrett Nunn was shot five times. Fortunately, about three of them, as I understand it, hit his vest. Two of them hit him once in the leg and once in the arm, once in the leg. He's doing fine. The doctor said it was kind of miraculous because the bullets didn't hit a bone and they didn't hit a major artery. He was very blessed at what happened. But it's just, it was shocking. It's shocking that somebody would, would do that, just ambush an officer. They went inside the, the apartment where this man lived to check on the, dis, the domestic disturbance and they found that he had, before he had attacked the police officers, he had killed his girlfriend. He had just his live-in girlfriend, they got in an argument and he felt that it was necessary to pull out a gun and take her life. Just evil. Just totally evil. What did we see in the last couple of weeks? What did we see in the last couple of weeks? Shootings of two Walmarts in the same day? El Paso and Dayton, Ohio? There was a third one that was foiled, fortunately, by a, a firefighter that happened to see something and stopped the guy. We've seen shootings in schools. We've seen shootings at churches. We've seen shootings in malls and shootings in movie theaters. We've seen shootings in <laughs> everywhere. Just violence, violence all across our country. It's just absolutely evil. There are calls for gun control, and I don't want to get into politics today. I don't do that from the pulpit. But, you know, it's, it's not the gun's fault. A gun is an inanimate object. There has to be somebody with intent to use it. With intent to use it. And that's where the problem lies. That's where the problem lies. We have a problem in our country with morality. We have a problem with our hearts. We have a problem with people turning away from what we know is true and honest and good and turning to whatever they can imagine is the truth. And this is where it gets us. For 50 years now, our schools have been infiltrated with this philosophy that truth is what you make of it. Truth is what you want it to be. The old standards of what was right and wrong are not relevant anymore. And this is where it's gotten us. We have too many parents that are not involved in the lives of their kids. We've got too many parents that are separating and leaving their kids, spending one weekend here and one weekend there. And you know, it's not politically correct to preach about that because you might hurt somebody's feelings, but this is where it gets us. This is where it gets us. We've got too many kids being brought up with one parent, one mom or one dad struggling and struggling to make ends meet instead of mom and dad in the house together raising them as God designed it to be. That's the way it was in the beginning. That's the way the family is supposed to work. That's the way it's supposed to run. But we've turned away from that. We even glorify 
even glorify single parenthood. I, I'm not picking on single parents because I love them and they work hard and there's some wonderful ones out there, but they've got a long, tough road ahead of them. And that's not how God wanted the family to be designed. He didn't want our marriages to break up. He didn't want our families to fall apart. He didn't want this the bedrock of our foundation to be crumbling. That's not what he designed this country to be. It's not what he designed our lives to be. But this is where we are. We don't have a problem. We don't have a problem with, with guns. We have a problem with our hearts. We have a problem with our morality. We have a problem with the fact that this morning, out of the 300 and some odd million people that live in this country, maybe... 40% of them are in church. Maybe. And on a weekly basis, of those who attend church on a weekly basis, the last statistic I heard was that maybe 20% of the country attends church on a weekly, weekly basis. That's why we are where we are. We've turned our backs on God. We've taken Him out of our public life. We've tried to take him out of the schools. We've tried to take him out of government. We've tried to take him off of our, our public buildings. And this is where it gets us. This is where it gets us. And it's tragic. And we see evil winning the day. I'm a little, I'm kind of ticked off this morning. Because I see so much of this around our country. And our politicians are not helping. They're not helping of either party because they want to stand up and they want to point fingers at people who don't believe the same way they do and tell them, well, because you don't agree with me, you're a Nazi or you're a, and then fill in whatever label you want to fill in after it. They're not helping, none of them. I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, or a Martian. I don't care. They're not helping. Maybe we ought to send them all to Mars and let them fight it out there and the people with some sense can run the country. <sighs> what we need are beautiful feet. What we need are beautiful feet. We need people who are willing to spread a message of hope. We need people who are willing to spread a message of peace and joy and what's right and what's wrong and standing up for that. We need people who are willing to teach what the Bible tells us is true. There's a trend. There's a trend in church that really kind of bothers me a lot. I mentioned this Wednesday night, so if you were here Wednesday night, you're going to get it again. I've, I've heard some ministers saying that, you know, I, I want to know what Jesus said, not necessarily what the Bible says. That really upsets me, because the Bible is a book that's written by God, the whole thing, not just one part of it, not just the red letters that Jesus said, because those people that say that, they even argue about what, what Jesus may or may not have said. And Well, we think that Jesus said this, but we don't think he said that. It's disturbing, it's frustrating. The Bible is a book that comes straight from God and we need people with beautiful feet who are willing to teach it. Willing to teach it. Teach the entirety of it. Not casting it aside as some antiquated, dust-covered relic of the past, but who really believe that it is live and active and that it is a sword that can separate spirit from flesh. And that can be a guide for our lives and a guide for who we are supposed to be. We need beautiful feet. We need beautiful feet. I say beautiful feet because these scriptures that, that Susan just read for us talk about the fact that, that hope comes from those who are willing to go and to spread the good news about Jesus Christ and who are willing to go and teach the entirety of the Bible itself. Teach the entirety of the Bible itself. They have beautiful feet because they spread hope. They spread goodness. We're going to see a couple of things about this scripture this morning. We're going to see why Isaiah said that these people have beautiful feet. It's because of the message of hope. We're going to see what those feet do and, and we're going to see what the result is. First of all, they, these beautiful feet, they spread a message of hope. And Isaiah is using a figure of speech here. 
okay? He's not talking about literal feet. He's talking about the message that these feet bring. And in his day, it was needed. In Isaiah's day, it was needed. It was needed. The people of God in Isaiah's day in 750 BC, that's about the time frame that Isaiah wrote, they were corrupt. Their nation was corrupt. There was no justice. The people had abandoned their faith. They were involved in idol worship. They were involved in just terrible, terrible things. And the spiritual condition of the nation had slumped. It had slumped. And it was, their, their faith was almost non-existence, non-existent. So Isaiah was writing this book, which was given to him by God himself, to warn them, first of all, that if they kept on this path of unfaithfulness, that terrible things were going to happen to their nation. He was warning them. He was telling them that God was angry with their nation because they were so immoral, because they were so corrupt, and they had turned away from their covenant that they had made with God himself. He was telling them, God's going to withdraw his protection of you if you continue on this path. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Just less than 200 years later, in 586 BC, the Babylonians invaded from the north. They came through Judea and they laid waste to the entire country. It was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. The Temple of Solomon was destroyed. The walls were, were broken down. There was nothing left of it. It became a haunt for jackals, as the prophets say. God withdrew his protection because they broke his covenant. Isaiah had warned them about it. He told them what was going to happen, but they didn't listen. But the other message in Isaiah is a message of hope. Because Isaiah knew that, that they need, these people needed a message of that God had not abandoned them. When that invasion happened in 586, many of these people were carried off into captivity into Babylonia. They were slaves there. And they needed a message of hope. They needed to know that God was disciplining their nation and punishing their nation, but that he also still loved them and he still wanted them to come to repentance. And so there's some beautiful, beautiful passages in Isaiah that talk about the hope that God has given us. The ultimate hope that God has given us. <coughs> Excuse me. Isaiah was writing about the prophets and the teachers who were going to come, that were going to tell the people, God hasn't abandoned you. He's writing about the people who were going to come to say that if you repent and if you return to him, God is going to take care of you again, and he's going to renew this covenant because his love endures forever, as we sang this morning. And there's a message for hope, of hope for us today. There's a message of hope for us today. We need beautiful people, beautiful feeted people who are willing to share that same message of hope we need Sunday school teachers. We need vacation Bible school teachers. We need nursery workers. We need children's church workers. We need adult Bible school teachers who are willing to share the good news of what God has done, who are willing to stand up and say, we're on the wrong path. We need teachers who are willing to, to hold us accountable for what's right and wrong, but who are also willing to teach about hope and who are also willing to teach about the salvation that God offers us. We need people who with beautiful feet, spiritually, who are willing to take on the responsibility, the incredible responsibility of presenting the message of the scripture and telling us when we're doing something wrong, but also telling us that there's forgiveness through repentance and there's hope through faith. We need that today because it's a mess out there. There's a lot of good in our world. There's a lot of good in our country. I sound pessimistic this morning, and I'm not completely. I'm not. Because God has created a beautiful place, and there are wonderful people who live in it. 
But the more we look around, it seems the more that evil is advancing. That's the way it seems to me, especially when we hear in the news about the things that have been taking place over the last few weeks. We need this message of hope. We need it today. Because there's darkness out there. There's loneliness out there. There's anger. There's hate. There's division. We as a church need to be presenting this message of salvation every chance we get. And we need people who are willing to take up that mantle of teaching. And we have them. We have them. We have some wonderful teachers here who are dedicated to doing this. What do these feet do? What do these feet do? Well, they present this hope. This is the second thing I want us to say, I want us to look at this morning. They present hope. They go where the darkness is. They're willing to go where the darkness is. They're willing to find it, and they're willing to present hope in it. They're willing to go outside of the walls of their churches and find where the darkness is. They don't just sit inside their pews. They're willing to walk through the doors. They're willing to go to a place that, that maybe isn't the safest. Willing to go to a place that, that maybe isn't the, the place they would choose to go in order to share this message of hope. We as church need to be willing to get out to move out beyond these doors, to move into our community and to share this hope with the people that are around us. Unfortunately, right now, there are people who are leaving the church in droves, not but church worldwide. They're leaving it in droves because they're not finding that hope that is supposed to be here. They're finding half-hearted worship. They're finding arguments, they're finding silly, petty, little conflicts brought about by people who just want to have their own way. They find people who are willing to compromise on what the truth is. They find people or churches who are unwilling to open their hearts to those maybe who are a little different from them. The church is suffering. The church is suffering. They find people who aren't willing to be innovative but just want to do everything the way it's always been done instead of being excited and motivated about what happens and excited about maybe doing something that's going to reach people in a different way, in a creative way. That's what they're finding. That's what they're finding. We have to be different than that. We have to beautify our feet. We need a spiritual pedicure <laughs> with some pink toenail polish or something. I don't know. We need, to, we need to be excited about what's going on here. We need to be excited about spreading that message. And we need to be excited about everything that happens here. And we need to be all together. And we need to be united instead of being divided. We need, to, we need to take hold of the mission that God has given us. And we need to focus on it. And we need to accomplish it together. Working together. Not working against each other, but working together. That's what God wants. What do these beautiful feet do? They go. They walk. They find people who are in need of the love of God. I've heard in, in other churches before, whenever I've spoken about the fact that we need to share our faith, we need to share the hope we have. Sometimes there's somebody who says, well, you know, all my friends are Christians, and I don't know about anybody who, who needs to know. about." The, well, then get out there and find somebody. They're all around us. If your friends are all Christians, then you need to get some more friends. Stay friends with those Christians. That's good. That's good. Most Christians are good people and good to be friends with. All right. But go find somebody else. Go out there and meet somebody. Go volunteer someplace. 
Go find an organization that needs some help so that you can meet some new people. Go visit your neighbors. And half of us don't know the names of our neighbors. We might know the one next door, but we don't know the one two or three doors down. Go meet that person. Take them up pie or you know, take them some cookies or whatever. <laughs> Just don't bring any to me. I'm not eating any for a while. But we got to get out of our... We got to get out of this this idea that that we can just exist as Christians and just go on and just kind of be. Blah. We need to be thrilled and excited about what God has done for us. That's what those feet do. They go, they walk, they move, because that's what God has called us to do. And the result of people who go. That's the third thing I want to say. The result of the people who go and do this is that there's a hope realized. That's what happened, not in Isaiah's day, but a couple of hundred years later, when all those prophecies came true, the nation was destroyed, but there was this, this book of Isaiah that was providing hope for the people. And there was Jeremiah, and there was Ezekiel, and there was Daniel, and there were many of the prophets that they could read, but it provided hope for them. And eventually that captivity was over. The Babylonians were overthrown, the Persians took control of the area. Darius the Great released the prisoners that were there in Babylon. They could go back to their homeland. They rebuilt the temple. It wasn't as grand as what it was. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. That's, that's all described in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. The hope was realized. And they were faithful. They didn't have a problem with idolatry again after that because they read those words of hope from Isaiah and they, they devoted themselves to it and they were excited about it and they rebuilt their nation. It wasn't as grand as it had been before. That was part of the discipline. And God was about to bring something even greater into the world because it was just a few, few hundred years after that that Jesus was born. But that hope was realized. They understood that what was promised came true. When we spread hope, when we spread hope, people realize the love of God. People understand how great our God truly is. When we're willing to talk about what God has done in our lives, people hear that and they need it and they respond. We may not see it immediately, but it happens. It makes a difference to them. There's a realization of hope when we're willing to step outside of the walls of our church and share the salvation that God has for us. We wanted to, uh, we wanted to say thank you this morning to those who are spreading that hope here at church. We've got some teachers who are here who work very hard at sharing the hope that God has given us and we wanted to recognize them Sunday school teachers VBS junior church adult Sunday school all of those all of those who have dedicated themselves to teaching over the past year if you are a teacher here if you are a teacher if you have taught in any capacity over the last year we want you to stand up right now stand up right now if you're a you taught in any capacity of the last year. Give them a hand. They deserve it. You can sit down. We appreciate that. We appreciate people who are willing to do that, who are willing to take those, that class of five-year-olds that run around and drive you crazy for an hour and teach them the love of God and teach them the hope. We appreciate them. The ones who will take a a group of teenagers who can be a challenge, and because all teenagers are, all of them are. It just all. doesn't matter. All, not, not picking on anybody. All of them are, and you would spend some time getting to know them and teaching them. We appreciate that. We appreciate those who are willing to sit down in an adult, adult class and and teach and and help people understand what the Bible says. So thank you to those of you who have beautiful feet. I was going to have y'all come up here on stage and take your shoes off, and do, but I thought that might be scary, so we didn't do that this morning. That might not be a good thing. Yeah, no. No, certain things we don't want to see, yeah. 
Yeah, we can find beautiful feet. All right, we're going to go into our invitation time. I'm going to call our, our worship team up. Shirley's not here, by the way, this morning. Shirley had some side effects from the chemo treatment that he had earlier this week. That's why you don't see him up here. He got to take a full chemo treatment uh, on Monday, uh, which is good news. But the side effects that, uh, that he's been going through for the rest of the week have been a little bit more serious than what he had been experiencing. And, and I believe he spent uh, Thursday night in the emergency room with, uh, with some problems. So keep him in your prayers. We've got several who are in need of prayer. Our congregation is going through a time right now where we're, we're suffering some physical ailments. But I know that God is going to bring us all through it. And we are going to be the stronger for it at the end. So let's be standing. Let's dedicate ourselves this week and in the weeks to come to having beautiful feet, to sharing the message of love and hope that God has for us. Let's sing through our invitation. <laughs>